power way. What's your problem? Every time it's a food, 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 food. I don't want nothing to eat. has since been detected in countries like Denmark and Australia and has also been confirmed in Caribbean islands including Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica. I love that boy. And he don't love you. Uh, just now, Mary, I'll talk to you in a while. Avash is man. Avash. You that's vash with the way you grind upon any little thing you Wait, see. Don't tell me. Joshua, let's just go on the damn floor. Yeah, what's taking me so long? Man? Hello? Oi, are they calling for how long, sir? I thought I was on a call. Ah, now you're so, who you're talking to? They're looking up Ingram, man. How are you? Oh, I know you're skim, bro. I know you're skim. No worry, no worry. <laughs> The final eight contestants will vie for the 2022 Word Up Championship. Vote now for your favorite poet for the People's Choice Award. Here's how to vote. Visit the college's Instagram page at so underscore author underscore Lewis and like one of our comments below this post with the contestant of your choice. Please note, comments do not count as a vote. Or visit our Facebook page at SALCC and like the video of your favorite poet. It's that easy. Voting closes on Wednesday, 26 January 2022. Tune in to the Word Up Finals on Friday, 28th January 2022. Your Excellency, Dame Paulette Louise, Chair of the National Nobel Laureate Festival Committee and members of the committee, members of parliament, members of the diplomatic corps. Dr. Govan Ferron was born in England to Jamaican parents. He lived in Jamaica. Ms. Cleta Springer, Chair of the Board of Governors of the South Lewis Community College and members of the board, acting principal, management, staff of the Family, students, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, and our online audience. Welcome to this year's Arthur Lewis Nobel Laureate Lecture. This lecture is a marquee event in the calendar of the SALCC, where we celebrate the life and legacy of our namesake, William Arthur Lewis. This year, we feature a distinguished academic one with a Caribbean heritage who will be speaking with us on issues related to Arthur Lewis's work. Dr. Govan Ferron was born in England to Jamaican parents. He lived in Jamaica for four years before moving to Canada in 1968. 
He has a master's and bachelor's degree in agricultural economics from the University of Guelph and earned his PhD in economics from the University of Western Ontario. He also holds a chartered professional accountant designation CPA, CGA and Institute of Corporate Directors designation. Dr. Ferron is currently the president of George Brown College in Toronto, a post he assumed in August 2021. He leads George Brown's efforts to provide transformative opportunities that meet the educational and career goals of students and requirements of employers that support the growth of industry and foster the vitality of communities. Dr. Ferron previously served as the President and Vice-Chancellor at Brock University and at Brandon University. He has held progressive roles in post-secondary education and also has a strong teaching and research record economic, environmental, and social issues. Dr. Ferron is a recipient of the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Award 2013, the Mikhail Jean Foundation Influencer Award 2017, and the University of the West Indies Vice Chancellor's Award 2020. Dr. Ferron, who has a strong background in economics and government policy, says that Sir Arthur Lewis's work was crucial and inspiring to his own development as an economist policy advisor and as a leader in the post-secondary education sector. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Govan Ferron to deliver his speech, The Future of Economic Growth and Development, Sir Arthur Lewis in the 21st Century. Online, and as a result, I'll have a presentation to be able to be more interactive uh, with all those members uh, who are listening on and uh, joining in on this very important uh, recognition of the work and life of Sir Arthur, uh, Sir Arthur Lewis. And in that, I'll be sharing my screen now. Thank you. Well, as we get started, I think it's really important to, to recognize uh, that Sir Arthur Lewis uh, in his life um, and to today has had such an influential impact on, on economics and particularly around the area of on the areas of economic growth and economic development. And as we think about our, our globe and as we think about the world today, uh, his footprint, his influence, and his thinking has been so influential in the way we approach economic development and the way we approach economic growth. So it really is indeed my honor to have the opportunity to be your speaker uh, this year uh, in recognition of his work and in recognition of his contributions. Uh, as was just made mention uh, in terms of the welcoming remarks, uh, the protocols um, have been had, and as a result then, I'll just recognize uh, the amazing individuals who've been a part of uh, establishing uh, this uh, recognition of the Nobel Prize winners uh, for St. Lucia, and uh, all the individuals uh, across the entire country who I think can be so proud of uh, this event and this ongoing recognition uh, that's held each year uh, of um, the uh, individuals who've um, been so prominent uh, at a global uh, stage and on a global stage uh, for the country, for the region, and for us all. Uh, as we think about uh, that legacy and that context, um, it is also to be uh, a moment to recognize that this is the uh, 29th uh, annual event uh, in recognition of the Nobel uh, Laureates uh, Festival uh, that's held. And as we think that, uh, it's also to recognize that St. Lucia, St. Lucia uh, with a population of just over 180,000 individuals, um, has had two uh, Nobel Prize winners, which means that it actually ranks number one 
um, across the globe in terms of per capita basis of uh, Nobel Prize being awarded. So as we think about this, I, I think about this event, this festival, and how you celebrate the achievements of your scholars, and I believe it provides the kind of impetus and, and incentive uh, for individuals to think about their work and think about it on the world stage and to recognize that as individuals, uh, they can be so influential in shaping the thinking um, of others, uh, whether in economics or in literature, or who knows what will be the uh, next area uh, that someone from St. Lucia uh, will be winning uh, the Nobel Prize. And just like to uh, recognize that outstanding achievement um, of um, individuals uh, from St. Lucia, and as uh, was made mention in my introduction, uh, given that I'm also of Caribbean heritage, um, I applaud um, this amazing uh, contribution to the globe um, from St. Lucia. Well, uh, as we think uh, about the, the context um, of um, Sir Alfred Lewis, uh, it's important, I think, to, to recognize uh, his, his background, his heritage, and his context. And uh, without question, uh, throughout his life and throughout his work, it very much reflected um, his formative years. And those formative years of him being born in St. Lucia and uh, going to school uh, in St. Lucia and then moving on throughout his career to become a leader and so distinguished in terms of his academic and administrative and, and leadership contributions uh, to us all. On the academic side, uh, many of you will know, of course, uh, that he got his PhD um, and started um, his uh, university attendance at London School of Economics. He went on to um, the University of Manchester, uh, to Princeton, uh, both as full professors. Um, also, he served uh, in terms of uh, his academic activities as the president of the American Economics uh, Association. And um, as someone currently in Toronto um, at George Brown College, being president, the president here, here in Toronto, Toronto. It, it's to recognize uh, that uh, he also received an honorary doctorate from the University of Toronto as well. So um, there is indeed a, a slight Canadian connection that I'd like to also celebrate being here in Canada. Um, well, it's also to, to note that on an administrative uh, level, uh, he had uh, such a distinguished career uh, in terms of being uh, the Vice Chancellor at the University of the West Indies, um, as well as um, his role uh, in establishing the um, Caribbean Development Bank, um, an organization that was so influential and has been so influential in the development of uh, the economies across the Caribbean. Uh, at the UN, uh, his his uh, role as a special economic advisor uh, for the UN um, to the Prime Minister um, of Ghana, um, as well as his role uh, in terms of the um, UN Special Fund. Uh, what I think is also befitting uh, of um, this uh, moment is to also recognize uh, the college uh, which is, is um, bears his name uh, and how it then carries on his legacy of leadership and contribution uh, to the students and to the nation um, and broadly uh, to us all in terms of its role uh, in education. Well, as we uh, start thinking about his contribution in economics, I, I think it's, it's clear um, and self-evident in him being recognized with the Nobel Prize in uh, economics um, that he had a, a significant uh, role in terms of, of economic thinking and his role in how economists uh, now think about uh, the economy, economic development, economic growth. Well, I think it's also befitting for us to stand back and, and think about uh, economics uh, as a social science. And in that context, the world in which he operated in uh, and his times uh, as well. Uh, at the time of um, his work, uh, we can also recognize economics as a social science. 
And in that context, it's looking at the idea of how individuals interact and their um, behavior, uh, but particularly their behavior in terms of choices they make um, in the marketplace and in the economy, and how those choices aggregate up to um, aggregate uh, outcomes, whether it's in terms of overall economic activity, employment, inflation, um, all those kinds of um, components uh, represent a social um, side of, of economic well, the science side of economics is um, the, the point of um, putting forward a set of assumptions or ideas that underlie a theory. And one of the main things about uh, theory in economics is that uh, the idea is that it should make predictions, make predictions about outcomes um, based on a set of conditions or a set of choices. And the science part of it is testing uh, those predictions and testing those hypotheses. So what we've seen over the years uh, since some of the formative work of uh, Sir Arthur Lewis is uh, that economists have gone out and tested a lot of his predictions. And uh, through that work, it's reinforced some of his predictions, um, but it's also provided uh, some nuances as to how we think about economics. Uh, well, I also think um, that it's important to recognize uh, that, that he just had a, a significant amount of contributions and, and output uh, throughout his years. And uh, some of that is, is held in a collection at the University of the West Indies uh, in Barbados. Uh, and to also note that he had more than 100 um, publications uh, to, to his um, professional career. Uh, two of the, the main uh, pieces that I'll be drawing on uh, as we go through the discussion and talk tonight um, was his um, early article, uh, 1954, on economic development with unlimited uh, supply of labor. And uh, the next one being his book, uh, The Theory of Economic Growth. Uh, I, I can tell you, and uh, hopefully you can see on camera here um, as I do this, uh, that I actually have his book here with me uh, that's been a, a mainstay um, uh, of mine for quite some time. Uh, well, in that work, in those two works, he really did establish a, a set of principles and theories and ideas uh, that, that led to uh, what we contemporarily think of, of as economic development and, in fact, economic growth. So when we think about today, almost 70 years um, later, uh, those works uh, still remain really relevant. And I hope as we go through that I can demonstrate and, and show why this work is so important uh, to us today and as we think about the future. Um, well, it's important, I think, as well, when we think about individuals and we think about their contributions, to recognize uh, that to understand their contributions, we sometimes have to take the time to understand the person. And um, when one thinks about him and when one thinks about Sir, Sir Arthur Lewis, um, it's to recognize um, that um, he is uh, a, a, a person of, um, a person from St. Lucia, and that heritage and that culture informed um, the way he thought about his world in very profound and significant ways. Uh, it's also interesting to note um, the weight that he put uh, in his work on education and knowledge, and to recognize then that both his parents uh, were teachers. And in that context, you could see how that formative uh, context around him uh, then defined how we thought about economics and how we thought about um, development and, and economic growth. Uh, another item uh, that's a reality for um, St. Lucia uh, is um, the agricultural sector. And he would have seen the agricultural sector and what it meant to local markets uh, in a way that many economists at the time um, didn't necessarily understand in the, the fulsome uh, form that he did. And it becomes um, very foundational to his work. Uh, the other part of it is that he accelerated through school and as a result uh, graduated early, went to work for government and um, in St. Lucia and um, seeked uh, the idea of getting a scholarship to be able to go to England to study engineering. 
uh, at that time, and, and I think that we are um, well aware of uh, some of the challenges um, uh, that, that were had by individuals from the Caribbean, uh, it, um, black scholars at the time, uh, in terms of being able to access scholarships and programs. And there were no scholarships available to him to study engineering, but there were um, uh, scholarships available to study economics and commerce. And that's indeed what he did at London um, School of Economics. And I think um, for us all, um, we're surely um, the beneficiary of, of that choice that he made. Um, but who knows what he would have gone on to do with other possibilities available. Um, clearly, we want to applaud, applaud um, the achievements that he's had. Um, he went on to teach, as uh, mentioned uh, before, um, at the uh, University of Manchester. And I, I think that's important, again, to be able to understand the person. Uh, we can recall that Manchester was um, really a, a significant component of the uh, Industrial Revolution in England and, and uh, the evol evolving uh, new economy uh, that was happening uh, in the 17 and, and 1800s. Um, and along with that, um, uh, individuals such as um, Engels, uh, who wrote um, um, his work on um, the conditions of the working class in England, um, then the linkage, of course, to Adam Smith, um, 1776, um, to Malthus, to Ricardo, to Marx, and so many others. Um, that would have been a mainstay and, and uh, so foundational to uh, Sir Arthur Lewis in terms of his own studies and his own thinking. And um, that coupled with the fact that he was from St. Lucia um, gave him very much a global perspective. And the fact that he was uh, not only a student of economics, he was also a student of history. And that combination really became formative in um, the way he would formulate his ideas and how they then became so influential in economics. As we uh, think about his first um, really uh, significantly influential paper um, on, on limited supply of labor, uh, what's to be noted uh, there is it's important for us to kind of stand back and ask ourselves, what was the story he was telling? And um, of course, um, for myself, um, in, in many regards, uh, a lot of my own teaching, a lot of my own economic works, um, would be mathematical economics with a lot of equations and the likes. Um, but beyond, beyond all the equations, I think what's always important is to ask yourself, what is the story being told and what is that perception of the institutions and the economy um, that is being described? Um, and as a result, um, I think in reading um, Sir Arthur Lewis's work and in reading a lot of economics, at times we, we get paused by the math or we get paused by the sophistication of the tools being used. Uh, but in some respects, uh, the story being told um, is, is often the motivating um, reality be behind um, the work and becomes a foundation for the predictions um, of the models and the theory. So in, in Arthur Lewis's um, work on, on limited uh, supply of labor, uh, there's a story being told. And the first part of the story is the idea that there is a agricultural sector uh, that is really subsistence um, agriculture or subsistence sector. And in that sector, uh, there are individuals who are self-employed, there are um, entrepreneurs um, in, in that regard as well, um, and they're producing uh, off the land. Uh, but the amount that they produce um, is in some senses for themselves and supplied to a local market that economists will often call relatively thin, meaning that there isn't a, um, a, a significant um, export opportunity uh, for that, those products um, as well. They are very local uh, products. Um, but the other reality on it of one additional person to an acre of land, by way of example, will not yield more. It's the idea that um, by um, having additional people in the field, you actually might um, cause uh, production to decline. 
So as a result, there's actually an access of individuals available uh, to work um, on that farm or on that, that plot of land. Um, and in that regard, the economists would, would view that as suggesting that the marginal product or the marginal productivity is nearly zero. An additional person on that land isn't going to yield you uh, much more value. And what that also means is that the wage rate, which is related to um, marginal productivity, related to productivity, uh, that is very low. Um, and in that sense, uh, you also find uh, in this story that uh, Sir Arthur Lewis was telling, uh, that in this um, uh, subsistence uh, sector, you don't have a lot of savings, you don't have a lot of capital accumulation um, happening uh, in this sector. Uh, so capital is not going to be the big driver of um, productivity growth uh, in that sector uh, if it was only dependent on savings coming out of the sector itself. Uh, the next uh, component, though, is, is that he really sets up a story um, of a dual economy. So if we think of a dual, two things, one side of the economy is a subsistence type economy with surplus labor, and he sets up a story with the second sector in the local economy, uh, which is an industrial or manufacturing type um, sector. And that sector uh, actually uh, is dependent on both capital and labor. And in that sector, uh, labor is highly productive, highly valued, um, and indeed uh, could be viewed as being scarce relative to the um, amount of capital that's there. Uh, you could think of it in today's terms. Um, by way of example, this would be a sector with a lot of computers, um, but not a, um, enough individuals available to operate the, um, those computers. If you think of it as a um, a manufacturing sector uh, in terms of a sheet metal shop, which is being shown in that image. Um, it may be that there are a lot of machines, um, but not of enough individuals to operate those machines. So as a result, then, the manufacturing or the industrial sector is really looking towards hiring more people, more labor. It wants to pull more people in. And in that sense, it's going to end up pulling those people in from uh, the subsistence agricultural sector and pull that labor uh, in. And that labor that's being pulled in has a high value, a higher wage rate than the subsistence um, agricultural sector. Well, the next part of, of that story then um, is to ask yourself, where are these sectors located? And um, what he sets up is the idea that the um, agricultural sector is located in a rural setting. Um, and he thought of the uh, manufacturing or industrial sector, by way of example, being um, established in a urban setting. And if you think of his life in Manchester, for example, or in Britain, uh, in many respects, uh, that's a lot of the way that um, the Industrial Revolution took place, um, that it took place uh, in the urban center, pulling labor in from, um, from the agricultural or rural sector. So his description of that economy could apply to countries at a global level. And uh, in many respects, uh, if you think of the way he saw his world, he was not necessarily looking at a theory that applied to only a specific setting. He was looking at economic development and economic growth across the entire globe and trying to figure out some of the core explanations as to how to explain how economies had grown and how sectors had grown, um, as well as to explain why is it that you can also see economic growth taking place, but you can see in the subsistence um, sectors of the economy where wages don't necessarily increase and incomes don't necessarily increase. So that dual case, not only in terms of economic activity, but in terms of outcomes as well um, that he was describing. Well, um, as we mentioned earlier, um, as an economist uh, and the social science side um, of economics, uh, you would want to see uh, a set of predictions to say, um, with this theory, this story that he tells, 
uh, about the economy. Uh, what would be some of the predictions and can we go out and actually test to see if his predictions hold? Um, and one of the amazing things uh, about his predictions is that many of those predictions have held. Uh, so the economy and some of the economic behaviors that we see today um, are, are really consistent uh, with a lot of his predictions. Uh, one is of his first predictions that um, was one that was actually challenging uh, for a long time to say how generalizable um, is this idea, was that you could actually have economic growth without wage inflation. And you can think of this as um, the fact that there was surplus labor in the, um, the, uh, the agricultural sector that was flowing into the manufacturing sector. Uh, that means uh, that in fact, in the agricultural sector, wages might not go up at all because there's a surplus of labor. In the uh, manufacturing sector, as you got more and more people into that sector, wages would start to decline unless there was capital formation, unless you were getting more savings, more investment, more machinery, more computers into it, um, into that field uh, and into that sector, uh, wages would start to decline. So there becomes a point in which um, the wage uh, situation in the manufacturing uh, sector and the wage situation in the subsistence component of the economy starts to calibrate because individuals who may be rural will have an adjustment cost to be able to go into the urban centers and as a result then they're not only looking at the wages in the urban center they're also looking at the adjustment cost transportation a place to live giving up some of their culture and some of um, the the frameworks and the the lifestyle of, of the rural uh, sector another prediction um, of, of his was that his the predictions in the theory uh, based on that story he was telling uh, in many respects explained a lot of the economic development that had taken place um, in um, in England through the Industrial Revolution. Uh, another example um, that sometimes is forgotten um, is uh, what's called the Great Migration um, in, the, um, in, in the US. And this was the movement of um, African Americans uh, from the South uh, into the North. Uh, into cities such as um, Chicago and um, New York and um, Detroit, uh, for example. Uh, that great migration north um, is very much explained uh, by Sir Arthur Lewis's uh, work and predictions in that story uh, he was telling. Uh, in contemporary times, if you take a look at China and India, uh, Nigeria, uh, Brazil, uh, much of that movement then from rural to urban, uh, the idea of uh, uh, manufacturing or uh, industrial base that pulls labor uh, into those centers, again, is uh, so much explained uh, by what he was uh, making mention. Um, but to then recognize that he also predicts with that mobility, you get a calibration, a equilibrium in the wage rates uh, that does benefit uh, those individuals who are moving into the urban centers, but it's not as clear how does that um, benefit the income level of those individuals remaining in the subsistence or subsistence agricultural sector, um, which leads to a bit of a conundrum that he starts to explore later um, in his book on economic growth. Uh, so when we think of his contributions, simply from that first paper, um, the 1954 work, uh, it had a tremendous uh, implication uh, to the idea of monetary policy and policy around inflation and wage inflation. Because what he was basically saying, if you could apply knowledge to economic growth, if you could apply um, more capital formation to economic growth, you could um, have situations where you could have um, growth without wage inflation um, or commodity uh, price inflation. And for a long time, that prediction um, was challenged uh, to be able to say, could we ever see that? And it wasn't until uh, around the 1990s um, in a framework, what was called endogenous growth, where you had, for example, the internet uh, allowed uh, economic growth to take place 
uh, and through the knowledge economy without seeing uh, significant wage inflation. That went uh, a significant portion all the way up to maybe around uh, 2000, uh, where you saw periods of, of significant growth without uh, high wage uh, inflation uh, taking place. And that was a part of the prediction uh, that he had, meaning if you could increase productivity or if you could pull surplus labor into different components of your economy, you might not have uh, inflation with, with that growth taking place. Uh, the other uh, area that's really interesting is um, an area that's called evolutionary dynamics or evolutionary equilibrium. Uh, and in that context, the proportion of the population that stays rural, the proportion that stays becomes urban, and that change in that proportionality um, is an area of, of the idea of uh, evolution or changes that happen over time in the distribution of where people are and the industries where they are. Are. Um, and uh, that kind of, of work that, that he then brought forward uh, moved us away from what was at the time uh, quite often a static way of looking at things. Um, one can think of a static way of looking at things, of going to a market and seeing an exchange between two individuals and, um, and speaking about how that exchange um, takes place. Um, the invisible hand or the market. Uh, and in some senses, that's reflected um, in Adam Smith's work. It's that static look at what's taking place. Really important, really informative. Uh, but uh, Sir Arthur Lewis, in some senses, said we needed to take a look at what happens over time, what happens in terms of dynamics. Um, and what happens in terms of growth. Uh, and that became really important uh, to economists in how we think about uh, economics today. Uh, another uh, item, uh, though, is, is that some of the tools in his work uh, were uh, to test some of his hypotheses, where some were just being developed at the time, and in fact, some weren't um, even available at all. So it wasn't uh, until years later, some of his predictions were tested and then um, verified um, as, as holding. And consequently then, uh, such a significant uh, contribution uh, to our knowledge in the way that we, we think about um, things. Uh, but part of uh, his early life um, as having parents as uh, educators uh, became a contribution and an emphasis on the investment in education and the investment in knowledge. Uh, and I can tell you as uh, someone who uh, early in my career, particularly through my PhD years, um, who um, uh, looked at the work of Sir Arthur Lewis and um, looked at his uh, statements about the importance of education in uh, economic development and economic growth, um, how much that influenced even my own choices uh, to become an a educator myself um, and now to have served uh, as president of a, a number of post-secondary educational institutions um, in Canada. Uh, well, um, as made mentioned before, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, not just one, but uh, two of, of his um, key works, and the, the next one being uh, the theory of, of economic growth. Uh, this one is, is the book that was published in um, uh, 1955. And uh, when you take a look at the chapters uh, that were uh, listed, uh, it's sometimes pretty hard to recognize that he was writing this in 1955. Uh, for example, he had a chapter on knowledge. He had a chapter on capital, a chapter on governance um, and government. Uh, and then he raised the, the big question, um, is economic growth desirable? Uh, and what he basically said is that um, economic growth uh, contributes uh, to, to what's available, rele releasing uh, individuals from um, the uh, constraints of, of scarcity, uh, something that he would have noted that Malthus was concerned about the idea of um, could we feed the world um, in, in that sense, or would we end up with what was called a Malthusian crisis, the idea of, um, of uh, population exceeding um, the capacity uh, to, to actually supply and have uh, food available to individuals. Um, so he was asking the question, does um, is economic growth always benefit 
beneficial. And what he was making mention is economic growth might relax scarcity, give us more choice, um, but it does not necessarily always address um, the issues of distribution. And in that sense, the role of government and the role of um, society and the way we think about um, institutions and society, how they play a significant role in being um, able to couple with economic growth to be uh, make sure that we benefit on the broader set of society and not just those individuals who are working in uh, sectors that are growth sectors, um, for example, the manufacturing sector and the industrial sector that he would have used um, as the example, but we're benefiting um, citizens across um, a wide range um, of society as a whole. Uh, the, the other item I thought I would want to do is just to kind of stand back and uh, make a, a few observations and uh, to that uh, set of observations uh, as well. Uh, if we kind of look out um, at what he was uh, making mention, uh, one of the items uh, that he says that is, is so profound uh, in thinking, uh, he said, uh, we shouldn't invest in what's abundant, rather we should invest in what's scarce. And then he asked the question, well, what is scarce? And he emphasized often it's education and knowledge. Uh, and I, I think that's such a profound statement because if we think about what became today um, the drivers of economic growth um, and the drivers of, of the new economy, um, it was precisely that. It was education uh, and knowledge. So today we speak about the knowledge economy by way of example. Uh, another item he, he um, put forward, and I think some of these um, statements uh, at times can be misinterpreted uh, um, without a, a real um, detailed read and standing back um, and understanding him as a person. He was a person that was really passionate about uh, development and about um, uh, and, uh, and about his country, St. Lucia, and about the Caribbean region, and about um, uh, places across the, the globe um, that had experienced um, the impact of imperialism um, by way of example. And uh, what he says about that, though, he takes a look at, um, at what happened um, in terms of imperialism, um, one could even say multinationalism, and we really want to ask the question, why weren't we seeing uh, uh, economic growth and um, capital investment uh, that led to a, a broader um, distribution of possibilities uh, in nations uh, where um, uh, imperialism uh, took place? Uh, and uh, an insight on that is uh, the recognition uh, that um, imperial activities uh, were uh, a, a set of activities of investors trying to get a rate of return on their investment. And that rate of in, in return was going to come from um, uh, countries, um, the colonies, but the rate of return was going to flow back to um, uh, the home country. Uh, to be able to get the return on that risk or that investment. And um, at, at one level, uh, one might stop there. Uh, but what he uh, went to was the next phase was to be able to say that if uh, developing countries were going to have economic growth that was going to benefit them in the long run, then they needed a mechanism internal for um, savings and capital formation and for capital investment. And I think that's a, a really important message um, as well uh, that he put forward uh, in, in that regard. So in other words, um, one does have to be um, a uh, determining factor of one's own future uh, if one is, is hoping for that uh, investment and, and those um, uh, results to be able to benefit the citizens of, of one's own nation uh, in that context. Um, he does dedicate a lot of, of emphasis to prosperity, to standard of living, uh, to per uh, capital income uh, uh, as a result of economic growth and development. But again, he emphasizes uh, the role of government uh, and the role of leadership in making sure that those benefits are, are dispersed to the wider population. Well, um, at this point, you might say to yourself, uh, there's so much 
of a discussion of what he did. How does it relate um, to uh, that transitional point uh, to the 21st century? Uh, to recognize as well uh, that in his book on uh, economic growth, he ends with the idea of transition. So this is a really good spot uh, to transition from. And uh, what I'd like to be able to talk about is to transition uh, to four areas. Uh, one is the gig economy, next global warming, government and what I call competitive governance, and then knowledge, arts, and culture. And so let's get started and think about some of the items uh, that are impacting us today uh, and some of the implications for the future. Well, when we think about the gig economy, I can tell you here in Toronto, the gig economy quite often looks exactly like this. Uh, someone doing delivery uh, and, uh, and, and uh, as a result then, uh, quite often, uh, what's interesting is that they are quite often viewed as um, self-employed um, uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, who are operating their own business and doing subcontracting work uh, in as part of the gig economy. And we can think of a number of, of major um, companies uh, that have not only um, stated that, have actually litigated um, on that point. Uh, well, when you think of um, the idea of uh, the gig economy uh, across the globe, uh, it is a significant uh, number of individuals who would be considered to be uh, members of the gig economy, about 1 billion uh, individuals. In the U.S., um, maybe uh, 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 2 million and growing, and uh, others estimate uh, that the gig economy uh, or freelance um, as well represents about 10% of the economy. Now, at one level, um, if we just stop there, uh, it might be the end of the story, uh, but let's go on. Uh, if we take a look at the um, what the U.S. Uh, uh, um, uh, Bureau of Labor uh, defines, uh, as uh, the civilian population, uh, it's about 262 uh, million uh, individuals in, in the U.S. And uh, the uh, labor force, those individuals who um, are, are either working or declaring that they're, they are looking for a job or wanting to work, uh, that, that represents about 161 uh, million. So their participation rate, the ratio of the, of, of the eligible population and, um, and the uh, individuals in the labor force, uh, that's about 61.5% uh, currently. And this is um, some of the most recent data. Well, if you go back to uh, 2000, um, uh, 2000, when uh, the labor participation rate peaked in the US, uh, it peaked at 67.3%. Uh, which means that based on the same uh, civilian population, you'd anticipate the um, labor force to be about um, uh, 176 uh, million individuals, which means that the gap uh, of uh, individuals who are in the labor force uh, or could be in the labor force uh, if they were at peak participation rate, it's about 15 million people. Uh, so that idea of um, the gig economy um, being estimated at above 10% of the U.S. economy um, isn't so far off. Well, let's just think about where we are today. Um, the U.S. is experiencing inflation and um, as well as wage inflation. Uh, and uh, you can also see uh, its unemployment levels um, have been drifting downward, so economists would be increasingly concerned about inflation. Uh, however, uh, if the individuals in the gig economy are operating just at a subsistence level or are underemployed, it means if there was economic growth or a new revival in some of its manufacturing sector or um, new economies or new industries evolve, you could actually see a significant uptick in employment in the U.S. Um, and as well, that employment might not be inflationary as it currently is. The other part of it is if there are individuals in that um, 
gig economy or freelancing um, area uh, that have significant skills but don't have the ability to translate those skills uh, into jobs or have been impacted more recently by COVID and are with staying out of the economy. Um, you can see as we correct uh, those uh, considerations, you could see the U.S. labor force increasing uh, quite a bit um, and as well without a significant increase in uh, wage uh, inflation. Uh, and what that tells you then is that as we think about the U.S. economy, uh, that capacity of it to grow further without inflation uh, will be highly dependent, if you think of uh, Sir Arthur Lewis's views, highly dependent on capital formation, capital savings, um, and capital investment um, in what he would have defined as productive activities as opposed to consumer um, or just consumption activities or uh, activities that don't uh, boost productivity uh, in the economy. So in, in that regard, I think as we think about the gig economy at a global level, um, is to be able to ask ourselves, is the gig economy representing a new economy with great wages, or is it more mimicking um, what uh, Sir Arthur Lewis would have viewed as a uh, subsistence economy uh, that then becomes a component of unlimited labor supply to some degree uh, for new economic growth? Uh, challenging uh, questions uh, to be asked as well because he raised the question about the distributional impact on income when you see industrial growth does it still benefit those individuals if they're surplus labor in that sector well another area um, that i think um, his work has some implications to contemporary times and to the future uh, is to global warming uh, what's predicted uh, over uh, the next uh, just over 30 years uh, is uh, seeing uh, global temperatures uh, could rise uh, by as much um, as uh, 2 degrees Celsius. Uh, what would that mean at a, at a global level? Uh, that could mean a displacement um, of um, 2 million, two, 200 million individuals could be displaced um, from uh, their land, uh, from their setting, um, and uh, cause a significant increase um, in human migration, and in this regard, forced migration due to climate change. Uh, in some senses, um, Sir Arthur Lewis really spoke about the idea of um, migration um, being pulled into the manufacturing sectors. And he generalizes his model from a single country to um, a multi-country world um, through trade. And in that sense, you could see the industrialized um, countries pulling labor um, out of the um, um, uh, primarily um, agricultural or agrarian um, economies. Uh, so by way of example, I was born in England, um, so um, my parents would have been a significant part or example of that movement of individuals um, uh, from a rural setting into a highly manufacturing industrialized um, uh, setting, but at a global level. Uh, well, global warming is doing something that's um, much in reverse. It is doing a push on migration, so it's triggering that a uh, push migration. And in that regard, then, um, that means the ability of countries to absorb um, and um, to make that choice between whether it's going to be segregating that population or integrating um, uh, that population uh, will make a significant difference uh, to how we as a globe will function and, and operate. Um, but it also says um, that what was interesting in, in Sir Arthur Lewis's work uh, was uh, he started to look at the idea as to why was wages in the urban centers um, and, and in the manufacturing centers staying high and that not benefiting and dispersing across the whole economy. And part of that um, uh, then uh, was the barriers to entry. So the barriers to um, this population 
200 million people that will be moving across the globe, the more barriers to those individuals being uh, able to integrate into society um, of industrial nations uh, will uh, again cause a significant hardship um, between human populations. Uh, but as well, the capital investments that we make then um, and the way we adjust not only in industrialized countries who are the major emitters um, of CO2 um, gases by way of example, um, uh, the way we invest then at a global level will have a, a significant implication on um, that migration pattern. Uh, and it does speak to the need to think, think globally about how we um, uh, look at, at global warming, uh, which quite often is somewhat interesting uh, because quite often we look at local solutions without looking at what was uh, would later be called the externalities, looking at how we impact each other at a global level and what we need to be able to do so, to address those kind of scenarios. Um, well, um, next, uh, just has made mention in that listing that I had um, on government. Uh, he had a chapter on government, uh, but he also alluded to the idea uh, that we should be investing in that which is scarce. Uh, and um, governance uh, is often a scarcity uh, across the globe. And uh, he also defined out uh, what were some of the roles or could be some of the roles of government, uh, the idea of, of maintaining uh, public services. Um, in fact, attitude, influencing attitudes towards education, for example, towards knowledge, uh, shaping economic institutions, uh, controlling the money supply, uh, controlling uh, fluctuations and in investment, uh, he went on to say. Um, but I also think he alluded in his work to the idea of good government and good governance. Uh, and uh, in some senses, uh, that relates to the idea of uh, keeping the peace, uh, focusing on the well-being and the liberties um, of the members um, of the population within uh, one's borders. And uh, that's an emphasis there because it means as we think of global warming um, and forced migration by way of example, it means it's not just a focus on our, the citizens that are members of our society, but looking at the welfare of all those individuals um, who are within our borders as, as um, a duty of care and a duty of carriage. Um, and in that sense, thinking of uh, their well-being um, and their liberties um, within our borders. Uh, but it, it, the idea of good government uh, is also to recognize that it's so fundamental uh, to economic growth and development uh, that he was pointing to. Uh, an example would be on, on um, property rights. Um, are property rights uh, secure? Uh, is, uh, is, government, is the government trusted? And we could see this uh, more contemporarily with COVID. Um, is the government's advice trusted um, in individuals getting vaccinated and how that influences uh, the population and how attitudes um, and how government influences attitudes can be so influential um, in the economy. I would say um, the festival uh, that's held in recognition of, um, of the uh, two Nobel Prize winners uh, from St. Lucia um, is another example of influencing attitudes, influencing attitudes toward achievement and influencing attitude towards uh, education that should be applauded. Um, next um, is an area that was very elusive um, to Sir Arthur Lewis. And uh, what he was trying to, to figure out was why weren't you seeing um, the kinds of savings and capital formation in the rural sector that you were seeing in the urban sectors or that you were seeing in the manufacturing and industrialized sectors of the economy, but not in the rural um, subsistence um, farming uh, sectors of the economy. Uh, and I, I thought that if one uh, takes a look at remittances, um, quite often remittances are, are being um, um, sent back to our, our home um, um, country uh, by individuals 
who were part of that surplus labor within their country. Um, and uh, they, uh, at least uh, in the 1950s, the 60s, 70s, um, and they would have uh, primarily joined uh, the manufacturing sector. And as you can see, uh, even to today, um, remittances um, uh, hold uh, a significant share of overall uh, economic activities for many countries. The Philippines, for example, um, at about 10% and peaking in 2005 at about um, almost 13%. Jamaica, uh, 20% um, uh, by way of example. St. Lucia, uh, a smaller uh, level at about 2.5% of overall economic activity. Uh, but those individuals, as made mention, who would have left um, the rural setting um, would have also had a bit of a social contract uh, to their families and to their community uh, in that regard. And, um, and, and it, to note that those individuals, the remittances that they provide um, represent uh, a, a pension or an annuity uh, to those individuals who remained uh, in the rural setting. Uh, but if you take a look at pension um, available in Latin America and the Caribbean, by way of example, only 44, about 45 percent um, of the population, based on the, the data that I was able to, to, to garner, um, have pensions, which means then that the remittances going to individuals in the rural community or subs subsistence sectors of the economy uh, that's going into be able to smooth out their consumption and to um, support consumption and with very little left over for savings um, or for capital investment that would increase productivity in the rural sector. Uh, what that means then um, uh, is uh, that the role of government in um, creating um, pensions and access to pension uh, in, um, in the rural um, uh, components and uh, subsistence uh, agricultural sector is really important to be able to um, increase capital formation uh, in that sector. Uh, and not only that, it's also to recognize uh, that the machinery or the knowledge um, if it's imported, and I'm not going to um, use the language of, of, of import replacement, because uh, that's not quite what I'm getting at here, but the idea of developing um, a knowledge industry that is working on, on the challenges that are local, that then means that the intellectual property rights and the patents around those means that the return to the acquisition of those inputs then end up going into the local economy as opposed to going to uh, economies that have uh, patents and intellectual property rights uh, outside of the economy, but for which those inputs are used. Uh, so again, um, what Sir Arthur Lewis was getting at in terms of education and in terms of knowledge was it wasn't education and knowledge solely for the acquisition of itself, but for the application to solving uh, economic and societal challenges uh, faced by uh, societies, um, but as well to not only think of that as solving challenges in urban and industrialized sectors, but to also look at rural um, uh, subsistence agricultural sectors as opportunities for significant growth because that knowledge um, uh, and, and input is lacking, is scarce. Um, well, uh, there are some other uh, intuition that Sir Arthur Lewis uh, points to. Uh, and one of the interesting items was his emphasis on creativity and the arts. And uh, it just made mention uh, that the idea of, he viewed the knowledge economy as uh, not only boosting productivity and boosting economic growth, but also being able to uh, establish patents and knowledge and the knowledge economy that then um, allowed for return on investments. And um, much like his dual economy um, frame, um, he viewed that there were some challenges or some realities that were local. And those local items uh, then um, uh, are opportunities to invest 
and, um, knowledge into to be able to yield the benefit of, of applying that knowledge to local uh, questions. So the patents and the commercialization that comes from it um, are benefits that then can accrue to the local economy and represent a dividend um, of knowledge. Uh, I think uh, quite often we don't think of the arts and culture in this same way, uh, but as somebody who spent most of his life um, in Canada and, um, and outside one moment, <coughs> excuse me, and um, outside of the Caribbean, um, I can tell you the arts and culture of the Caribbean um, uh, is so influential and um, whether uh, I can um, uh, look to Bob Marley or Rihanna or some of the actors that come out of the Caribbean, um, the poetry, the writing, um, the, the fine arts um, out of the region, all that arts and culture uh, quite often can't be replicated. Um, and as a result then, uh, when we think about product development, um, let's think about our, our running shoes with some of the greatest sprinters coming out of the Caribbean. Uh, the idea of taking um, sports and art um, and culture and then developing products around it uh, means then that those items commercialized, if commercialized and if put into the um, international setting uh, could uh, end up with a scenario as um, Sir Arthur Lewis was pointing to um, in, in that it's a return uh, on that knowledge, that car, um, culture and that art as well. So it's a different way of um, rethinking knowledge, arts and culture uh, that I think his work also pointed to. And it means then that your knowledge, your art, your culture is also your economy and your possibilities. Well, uh, some lessons learned uh, to Sir Arthur Lewis. And um, as you can see from that, um, that image um, on lessons learned, uh, sometimes um, they are profound in, in what they then inspire um, uh, later on. So the idea that productivity um, can drive employment, uh, but also can moderate uh, inflation. And uh, what that means is quite often we have fiscal policy focused around uh, employment. We have monetary policy focused around uh, inflation. Uh, we don't quite often have a ministry um, of productivity. Uh, and it does raise the question, uh, when we think of ministries of education, should we have ministries of education and productivity to be able to make sure that there's somewhere in government, uh, we are um, looking at education as a linkage to productivity and knowledge as a linkage toward um, being able to solve uh, societal challenges. And consequently, knowledge, education, and training uh, those individuals in, um, um, in subsistence uh, settings of the economy, um, which may even include uh, the gig economy, freelance, um, the role of education and training to support their transition uh, into um, other areas of the economy that may be growing for which they may not have the skill set um, that they can uh, be able to apply without some support. Uh, lessons learned around economic growth um, is to say uh, economic growth without policy um, may not address uh, necessarily or left on its own income distribution. So we do need to be deliberative and thoughtful about income distribution um, when we think about um, spurring economic growth. The role of savings and capital formation being so important um, if we're going to be able to, to have uh, economic growth and development. Uh, governance and good government being um, so much of a foundation. I think as we think about um, today's world where we can um, almost learn work from anywhere, uh, that means uh, if you ask yourself, um, quite often we're looking at how do we attract capital investment, uh, we may want to ask ourselves the role of good governance um, and how that could form the setting to be able to um, attract uh, talent investment, people with knowledge who can work from where um, uh, anywhere in the world, beautiful places such as the Caribbean um, in the world, uh, and but at the same time, uh, their skill set and knowledge um, being applied at a global level um, in a, a broader uh, economy at a, a global level as well. 
Uh, investment, the statement on invest in what is scarce. Um, and uh, that means that quite often what is scarce is talent, quite often what is scarce is capital, and in fact, quite often what is scarce is effective governance. Uh, I think that for all these reasons, um, Sir Arthur Lewis's work is really worth reading, learning, and thinking about. Um, and I also think um, uh, that in, in some senses, um, St. Lucia has found a um, magic formula because it holds at a global level um, the highest per capita um, um, recipients of the Nobel Prize. And I think this festival very much reflects that idea of celebrating your scholars and recognizing your scholars. And I think that does inspire and does create a eureka moment uh, for the next generation as well as a lesson learned. Well, with that, um, I'd like to say thank you. I understand that there may be now questions and I hope that uh, although I did go through relatively quickly uh, with a lot of volume to um, what was presented, uh, that it may be informative. Um, it spoke to that person on your screen, Sir Arthur Lewis, um, and it also speaks to that place, uh, St. Lucia, uh, and the outstanding work done. And thank you so much um, for giving me the honor uh, to be your speaker and to be able to make these remarks um, for the festival and for this amazing uh, work done uh, by all those individuals who've organized this session. I thank them and I thank all of you who've been a part of the audience. I will be stopping the sharing now. Okay, thank you, Dr. Farron. Thanks for placing the work of Sir Arthur Lewis in a historical context. I think very often um, the context is lost when we speak about Sir Arthur Lewis. He's static, he's frozen in time. Um, thanks for also showing us how Lewis's work is still very much important and how it helps, it still has an impact on how e economics is studied today. And one thing I thought was even more poignant is the fact that you made it clear that what Lewis produced had a very strong connection to who he was, and more importantly, where he came from. Thanks for that. Um, I think now we move again to a question session, and I have been informed that we now have a panelist, and uh, the panelist is Dr. Nurse, and you asked about him earlier, so Dr. Nurse will join the panel and make some comments now. And, and just as he makes the comment, I'd just like to say it's, it's so wonderful seeing him and um, not only I consider him a good colleague, um, but a wonderful friend, and um, so wonderful to see him. Thank you very much, Dr. Theron. I mean, it's a, it's a real pleasure to see you on screen.
being able to hit the wall if at least in the next two decades or so, um, where they will run out of surplus labor. Of course, they are investing in lots of innovation and productivity growth in other areas. Um, but I wanted you to, to think through and maybe share with us your thoughts on um, the one the way what what options are you can move into um utilizing some more indigenous talents and so forth so i, I wanted to 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 really um draw you out on that <laughs> uh, no, not not at all. And it, it, it was also uh, helpful for me to, to to hear the perspective that you gained and and took away from the presentation and, and the like. So uh, that helped me to to see some of the, the key points that that were takeaways. Um, well, two parts to your question, and um, I'm going to start off with the last one first. Um, and uh, thinking of Caribbean countries. Um, but by way of example, um, countries um, uh, uh, across the Caribbean having a particular um, characteristic in terms of uh, level of industrialization, um, economies, uh, components of the economies such as tourism, your point um, being well taken, that um, uh, competing in, in, in a crowded space um, doesn't necessarily cause you to, to get the kind of significant rise in economic growth um, that um, Sir Arthur Lewis was, was looking at, um, nor does it get the significant rise in economic growth that you see places like China or, or India um, has had over the last um, 25 years in that sense by tapping into a surplus component of the economy and matching it with something that was previously scarce, which is capital formation, um, um, Sir Arthur Lewis would point to. <clears throat> well, I think the, the item is, is um, you alluded to it in terms of research and development and investment in research, and I think that's important. But I also think that sometimes um, what is scarce um, sometimes is, um, is before us. And uh, the statement I would say is uh, there, the, if you take a look at the population of people of Caribbean descent at a global level, it's a huge population, all of which have developed skill sets and talent and the likes. Um, all of a uh, significant portion of which, if you took a look at the uh, distribution on the demographics, um, uh, a significant portion of those individuals are 45 plus, 55 plus, 65 plus, a significant amount. Those individuals are either thinking of retirement or thinking of a phase in their life where they can work from anywhere. So the only question is, if they can work from anywhere, if they can buy a cottage anywhere, if they could live anywhere, then why aren't they living in the Caribbean? And that means then that um, ultimately, um, as Sir Arthur Lewis pointed to, they care about their well-being, they care about safety, they care about peace, they care about good government. So if by some chance the Caribbean can invest in those elements let's take a look at, at crime statistics and some of not everywhere but some places um, individuals may not necessarily be recognizing it's not part of government influence and attitude to be able to say to the population that those statistics become an incredible deterrent not for capital investment that's just capital but for talent investment and the talent investment would be is a bigger important scarcity at a global level than capital. So that means then that a precursor is actually investing and in a commitment to good governance and good government, because that then sets the platform for a whole series of other items. So I would say that if, I would say in terms of that scarcity, and to your point on productivity, it's the value 
of another unit of investment somewhere, what does it yield you? And that, I would say, could have a significant yield because um, technology, let's say the internet, once upon a time was scarce, today it's cheap. So cloud computing, you don't need a, 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 a supercomputer to comp do computing anymore. You can do it all in the cloud. So that means what's scarce is talent. How do you attract the talent? By talent is associated with people, by creating environments for which it's really great for them to live. And you already have some natural items that um, others do not. I really like Canada, really like Toronto, but it took me three days to dig out my um, shovel, the snow from my driveway. So I don't know if I wouldn't mind and others might not mind spending a month somewhere in the Caribbean um, because it has great climate, great people, safety, and good governance. So that would be that one. Your point on China, I think, is really relevant in the sense that um, if it starts tapping into its full capacity in terms of, of that excess labor supply that was able to drive a low cost um, production, uh, that means then that the value of or the cost point of its export will start to increase. It will start and has started to um, experience uh, wage inflation. Uh, it then will have to have more domestic capital formation and capital investment locally, drying up some of the export capital uh, that it's been doing in terms of some of the global loans and, and so forth. But it also um, means uh, that uh, across the globe, we can't continue to depend on it being the goods basket for the rest of the world. Um, as in terms of cheap goods. Um, but it also um, means that it too, like so many industrial countries, will have the conundrum of asking the question, does it? Um, remember, um, by 2050 through global warming, you have 200 million people who are displaced. That means, depending on what it does with its immigration policy, and its labor force policy, it could tap into a global labor um, um, surplus labor and keep its cost structure low. The question then is, does that, do they do that through um, um, immigration? Do they do that through externalizing the investment to where that pool is, but then you also need to train um, and invest in, in the society? What does it do? Um, also remembering Sir Arthur Lewis's point about um, imperialism, um, meaning that if somebody makes an investment in your country, don't be um, offended when they tell you they want um, to extract a rate of return. No, that, that was excellent. Um, my, uh, your response to the questions and comments were, um, were spot on. Uh, I, in fact, I'm writing a paper on the economic impact of the diaspora and the future for the Caribbean right now. So um, that's that's on my desk. <laughs> so you know, you provide me some additional insights, which I'll be um, tapping into. So expect another email from me um, tapping into your brain on these matters. Oh, so thanks very much again. The dialogue. Yeah. It's a pleasure as well. So I, I put it back to the, um, to the moderator and chair, Dr. Fugens, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Nurse. Thank you, Dr. Farron. We have any questions in the audience? Mr. Jean-Pierre. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's good to be here after 20, 29 years of Jumo, use exercise. The, use the mic, please. Yes, good evening everyone. After 29 years of this exercise, it's good to be here again to look at um, some of the issues of the day. Um, this intellectual exercise, there's an ecstasy about it, but there's a little bit of fatigue as well. After 29 years, we come every year and we discuss these issues and of the economics, etc., etc. But there are some 
real case studies that we need to examine, especially what's going on in the Caribbean today, in the ghettos in St. Lucia, the, the killings and, and all of that. How does it impact? Or where are the theories and the practical solutions to all of these pressing problems or, or challenges that we have in the 21st century? Um, so let me, you know, in my mind, a mind all, all knowledge is like using a, 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 a knife or blade. It bleeds the hands that, that uses it. So we talk about the knowledge all the time of Sir Arthur Lewis, but in the praxis, how do we apply it? That's my concern in this time that we live in, especially in this time. What would Sir Arthur Lewis say about justice? What would Sir Arthur Lewis say about ethics? I'm not hearing anything about the ethics. Even if you have all the knowledge and you have no ethics, is the disaster. Corruption in high and low places. Stuff like that we need to address. We need to get back to basics. Equality. Um, land use. The land is shrinking in the whole Caribbean. What are the land policies? Where are our land banks? Food security. Food sovereignty. Food safety. All of these issues are the burning issues of our day. Climate change, which the brother addressed. But we need to drill deeper into these issues that affects us today, that the youth in the ghettos are, 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 are suffering because of the management of our resources. Something they call, I, 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 I call as um, Osimo economics. Maybe Sir Afelis didn't think of that one. Osimo, for those who don't know, was the patron saint of the stupid, of the idiot. If he was an island, he was a monk. He was so foolish he couldn't even be a monk. So they have him to, to take care of the mules, and he was the, 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 the laughing stock of all the other monks, the erudite of the, of, the, of the monastery. But what we see here now is a, is a, is a society with shrinking the lands in the Caribbean is shrinking more and more and yet with Osimo economics we give a, an investor our money to buy land and to sell it back to us and to take over the land that is shrinking and, uh, and the resource that is limited is that economics what kind of economics is that Osimo economics so these are the issues, case studies we need to examine the case studies when we come in these Nobel laureate lectures Let's look at the thing objectively and see what's going on in our, in our landscape, in our seascape around us. And let's use our, our creativity, our imagination to solve these burning issues. Another case study, if a group of St. Lucians went to the bank and asked them for a loan to, to purchase that land, they'd say, we're mad, but we give it to an investor. A uh, land 99 years lease for one dollar and give them the, our passports to sell. What kind of economics is that? So I this would sanction that. What? Me, my demand must be turning in his grave. So I am asking for case studies. Let us examine what's happening in our immediate presence in the Caribbean and how we could use Sir Afalus's model to look at this thing critically and use our imagination and our creativity and all the good minds, the PhDs and all the others and the local people. Let's have a kudme, a kudme kachil, a kudme of ideas. Nobody has all the answers. It's an ethical dilemma that we are in. A, a red butterfly feeding on a red plant and we're trying to feed um, and save both. It takes imagination to do that. It takes a lot of brainstorming, a collective to, to, to address this situation because all of the talk, what are, how are we addressing the problems of the day? When you have justice, you get a whole truck of, of, of marijuana. Nobody was arrested, nobody's accountable, but if you catch a, a youth in the ghetto with a little three youngs, you put him in jail. And you think the youth have seen that? They get rebellious when they see this kind of, this kind of thing going on in the society. The cardboard uh, environment um, issue. We cannot go on our, our Queen's chair or the, or, you know, or sometimes we make, we, 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 you know, they say, you mad, you want our land? 
Where's, where's the land? The land, the land, the people, the light. Say, say we shares. So, I mean, let's, let's start dealing with the issues of the day. That's all I'm saying. The case studies, the real issues, bread and butter issues, food security. Give, there are a lot of, um, let me give a solution. I give the, the, the problem, let me give a solution. One of the solutions is they have a lot of estates, old estates. You remember the Europeans build their empire and their wealth on the land and on our backs. We have a lot of um, estates that they follow. For example, Granant's estate, Maki estate, um, you have Esperance estate, and in the south we have estate. They left follow, and long people they have learned to work. You think young people they want to work land? Why are they going up in the hills and plant ganja? Because there's money in it. And why the crime? Because there's no control over it, it's illegal. So I plant my thing, you pass a new thief, I don't come and shoot you and say, well, but you don't respect my work. That is the issues, you know. So we have to deal with the real issues of life that's happening before our eyes and the, and the rising crime. How do we deal with these issues? Disrespect for people and all them kind of thing. You know, so let's get real people. Let us get real. And let's look at the issues and deal with it using Sir Arthur as, as, as a plow, to plow through the issues and help us with our collective so that we could solve these problems. I could go on and on, but give thanks. Let's ponder anew on the way forward. Thanks, Mr. Jean-Pierre. We have a question from Mr. Clarence Henry. Good night, um, everyone. Uh, Dr. Ferran, I believe your presentation was quite enlightening, and thank you for this. But you know, one of the biggest um, contributions I believe that I have made is the totality of this book. Where you always focus on the prescriptions and recommendations for economic development, economic growth. And your lecture tonight comes at a time when you're developing economies in general, but especially Caribbean economies are facing uh, a period of low growth coming out of the great financial recession in 2008. Um, and now we see an economic fallout from a global, uh, a global pandemic which is perhaps deeper than the global financial crisis to help you as a baby point. And you have now unemployment rising, um, and especially the condition of surplus and labor is in our environment as well. Um, and that exists especially among our youth where unemployment is in the many jurisdictions slightly of employment. Uh, nationally. And, and we do know that these conditions cannot persist for too much longer. We need to find a way to bring back um, solid, sustainable economic growth, but we need to talk about the ECCB sales. And this 5% that I think we have to do with the pandemic, we can't even talk about 5% sustained growth anymore. We have to talk about 7-8% or more. So to pull us out of what, what we have found ourselves in because of um, within 50 years, two major economic um, crises. So to my question really, and perhaps you may have addressed it somewhat um, prior to, to asking those questions. But what do you think then should be some and have the you know, prescription as well? What should be the, the, the number three, two, and one economic policy prescription for getting us out of where we are today? Because I think a large part of the challenge with governments is that the governments are still searching within the political economy environment. Governments are still searching for, if you like, the economic response to um, the traditional economic challenges that we have and our response to economic global um, shocks. 
government is looking for the sort of economic responses and prescriptions that can move us out of out of those challenges. So what would you consider to be the one, two, three key economic prescription for moving forward? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you for that question. And I'd also like to, to thank um, uh, the speaker for the remarks before and uh, the, the emphasis and uh, focus on uh, the, the youth um, as well as um, using um, his statement, um, the ghetto as well. Uh, the, we are born only on location by probability. So I see no difference between myself and that person in the ghetto. So we all have a responsibility to be concerned um, and to put our efforts towards um, uh, everyone um, for the betterment of everyone. Um, the, but I, I think in answering your question on um, the one, two, and three um, items, I'll, I'll also hopefully in answering this question maybe answer something on the practicality um, that was being said. Uh, we need to be practical and get results. So um, I think my, my first prescription uh, would be uh, policy stability. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by policy stability so that way um, it's not a catchphrase and, and we don't walk away going, well, you know, uh, what did he mean? Uh, and I'll, I'll give three examples of policy stability. So um, in, and, and just as a, by the way, the examples I'm giving is not to say um, uh, any place is perfect. Um, I, I'll pick uh, examples at a global level um, so that way we, we mix and match. Uh, the first one is by way of example of a policy um, stability um, uh, in the Canadian setting um, and in the UK, I think in, in the Caribbean to some degree, um, was the idea of universal health care. And what that meant then is that because of that policy stability, um, companies investing um, in the economy could have a um, expectation on their long-term investment um, of um, what would be the benefits package that they would have to offer uh, workers. And that meant that by taking that uncertainty out of the economy, uh, you ended up with uh, more productivity. Uh, that means then, to me, within the Caribbean, regardless of the political party, uh, there needs to be some um, items that becomes um, fundamental um, value statement almost ethical statements uh, that says we are committed to and one example I would say we are committed to every citizen getting a high school education we are committed to um, uh, every individual having some level of a pension um, we are committed to um, every uh, individual having a sense of hope such that out of desperation, they're not driven into crime uh, in that sense. Um, and what I mean by that is that there needs to be um, a, a sense of a national mission around what being a member of the society um, um, obligates you to, and it should obligate you to as a citizen of the society to the betterment of the society, period. And um, someone might say, well, those things don't matter, but policy stability really matters. And as you end up having significant swings in some fundamental platform for the society, you end up having um, swings in investment and in results um, as well. Um, the, I'm getting an echo back, so I don't know if a mic is on that, that may be our speaker mic causing an echo back. Second item I would say um, is um, is uh, a commitment uh, where uh, all the individuals in the society is actually committed to the society. And again, somebody might say that sounds like a simple thing. Da da da. Um, my two comments are um, first is that individuals engage in theft and poor governance because they think they can go somewhere or they think they can insulate themselves from somewhere. Well, um, I've lived in a number of countries. I've lived in a number of places. Um, you know, 
It may be the um, Bob Marley statement or a Rastafarian statement, where you're going to run to, right? Um, ultimately, individuals have to know that if they deplete the quality of life in their country, they deplete the quality of experiences that they will be having. Uh, so as a result, it's not, it's not some, to somebody else, it is we are all obligated to the betterment of our society. The next part of that is, um, is in Canada, um, this comes from the indigenous communities in Canada, and it's a statement of nothing about me without me. If we want to address issues in the ghetto, if we want to address issues of youth unemployment, if we want to address issues of crime, then involve the people in the solution. And that way, the, rather than turn it upside down, don't ask me as an academic or intellectual or somebody from outside of the region to solve the problem, but use me as a resource and have me matched with the youth in the community and they use me as a resource to solve their problem. So I become the scarce, relax, I become the item that was scarce that you solve. And they are the item that's plentiful and they probably have the solutions, but they may not necessarily know how to go about implementing them. So use the expert by turning it upside down. Don't ask the expert to go in to the ghetto and solve their problem, but have the ghetto have access to the experts to help come up with solutions um, that may be um, innovative, for which um, obviously, um, if it's persisted, um, haven't got solved by the experts looking at the problem, um, but rather working with those individuals to solve the problem. Uh, the third uh, item I would say, uh, and this may sound like a, a little bit of an oddity, um, is the value of optimism and hopefulness. Um, I, I think that it's very difficult to motivate um, anyone to solve anything um, if they are not hopeful and if they're um, also depressed. And that means uh, that the leadership um, in the region can't give up hope. Um, it has to show a sense of hopefulness and a sense of possibility and a commitment to being able to solve um, some of the challenges. And if you think of Sir Arthur Lewis's item, one of the challenges was how do you get capital formation and how do you get the universities and the colleges working at local challenges, helping local businesses, small businesses to be better as opposed to simply being the uh, institution away from the people such that it's not only to be an intellectual, it's not only to celebrate um, being learned, um, uh, and I put that in quotes and in modesty, uh, but it is also to celebrate being applied. Again, from Sir Arthur Lewis's example, remember um, he established the um, Caribbean Development Bank. He was the vice chancellor for the University of the West Indies. He was an advisor to the um, prime minister of Ghana. Um, he was not simply an academic who was away. He was in the field attempting to apply his knowledge to um, the benefit of others. So I say, take a look at, at um, in the job description of the academics in the region at the universities and colleges is a component of their job description include community engagement and community development. Is that part of their performance evaluation? And if it's not, then don't be surprised that they're not doing it. So I'll stop there. Thank you for that, Dr. Farrow. Okay, we're running out of time, coming close to that time where we have to pull the plug on this. Um, Dr. Farron, do you have any final comments, final thoughts? Sure. Um, there's, there's one, there's one that, that I, I, I noted um, um, uh, in, in terms, terms of, of uh, when I was uh, doing uh, my writing uh, for, for this, so my slides really reflect uh, a paper that I've drafted and I'll do some refinements on it um, and make it available, of course, um, to the committee, uh, the festival committee. Um, but one area that I had um, was on uh, the service industry. And I started to ask the question, 
um, what is this newly evolved industry? And if you take a look at the kind of lens that Sir Arthur Lewis looked at, um, so you could think of hunter-gatherer societies, agrarian societies, industrial societies, service economy, nervous, um, a knowledge economy. Well, the service sector represents, uh, for many um, developed economies, 50-60% uh, of GDP of overall economic activity. Um, for some of those economies, half of that is earned through services delivered um, outside of their country. It is now an export product. And that means then that that service that's being provided um, is, a, is a return on their knowledge and development. And that's what I was getting at when you take a look at arts and culture and sports and so on. The Caribbean um, is outstanding in all those spaces. Does it see those areas as export products? If I take a look at, at reggae, for example, um, but I could look at other, you know, um, other areas, um, Calypso, Soka, uh, so on. A lot of those um, arts were developed by the youth, but did we actually necessarily view those as export products and have an export strategy around the arts and culture, as opposed to have it as a um, come as a tourist and see, can you develop it as an export product? I can tell you uh, one of the major um, uh, things that I watch on TV is stuff coming out of Nollywood, Nigerian TV, right? And South African TV. Again, can you look at your arts and culture as an export product? Uh, because you have a significant portion of individuals of Caribbean heritage or Caribbean relations who would love to be able to access your arts and entertainment, um, but um, in their own living room at times. And they'll also come and visit too. So um, I would say don't underestimate the value of the service sector and the value and creativity of those youth uh, that may seem to be the youth uh, that, that are, are um, not being brought into or accessing the traditional economies, um, but they may be having incredible creativity uh, that could become an export product and, and income earning as well. I'll stop there and thank you so much. Farron, we now invite the chair for closing remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ferron. I'd like on behalf of the Board of Governors of the South Lewis Community College to thank you most sincerely for your uh, very probing remarks. Um, you have given us much to think about. Um, and in the intersection of Sir Arthur's works where you looked at the the, the, the science of economics and the social sciences and uh, where they intersect. Um, I appreciated as well the, the fact that you, you reminded us about who Sir Arthur was, how he thought, what, what ideas drove him, um, and and in, that, in doing that, I think you've given us a point of departure or, or a segue to the point that was raised by my good friend, um, Laurent Jean-Pierre. In future sessions like these, could we seek to transplant or to apply the visionary elements of Sir Arthur, the, his out-of-the-box thinking, is look at the systems and the, the integratedness between issues, the economics and the politics and the society. 
can we look at uh, the issues of competitive economics, competitive governance. Uh, we, have a, we have in the Caribbean a crisis of governance um, in many of our countries. And we, we did to do some of what we did before last year, I think it was, when we unthought, we had an unthinking session where we unpackaged or we tried to unpackage some of the critical issues that are facing our region and, and dissect it and, and try to put it back together again in some sort of logical uh, action plan, response strategy, what have you. Um, but the Caribbean is also facing a number of other crises. There's a crisis of vulnerability and consequently there's a crisis of resilience. Our citizens are not resilient. They have not been taught to be resilient. They have not been assisted to be resilient and consequently the region is in a state of a perpetual shock. We are shocked by shocks. Uh, pandemics, economic shocks, disaster shocks, and so on. And what I think we need to ponder is how do we build a resilient citizenry in, those, in a manner where our people take responsibility, not just for their, their safety, but also for their growth and for their development. Um, the, how do we reposition government, government um, to be more supportive of the aspirations of a people. There's a lot of thinking that we need to do on this um, because it is becoming increasingly clear that a focus on economics alone is not going to get our countries out of the social morass um, that they face. Um, and so the challenge for us going forward is how do we bring those disparate pieces together in a manner that offers hope to the common man and woman in the street. So I want to thank you once again, Dr. Ferron. Um, going forward, as you suggested, I think you, you did, um, where you suggested that the expert and I take that as, a, as an, an offer on your part, and uh, we will be taking you up on that offer, where we will seek to tap you, tap your brain and trap your expertise as we struggle to come to grips with the, the challenges that are faced at the communities in our, in our countries. So I thank you once again. I thank you for joining us th uh, this evening. Um, wearing my other hat, I'm very conscious that there's a thing called confinement time um, and I don't want to have you um, breaking the, the rules on that. So thanks to all who were integral in putting this event together. I want to thank the, the remarkable staff in the office of the, the principal uh, who have been working wonders over many months and many weeks in putting this event together. I thank our acting principal. I thank Dr. Nurse for joining us as panelists tonight. I thank our friends at the, the GIS NTN. And I thank you, Dr. Fulgens, for spearheading this event. Thank you very much, and have a good night. Good night. Thank you so much. OK, we've come to the end of our, our ceremony here. Dr. Ferron. All the best. Thank you for your valid contribution to our ceremony. Um, folks, thanks for coming, making this another successful lecture. I think it's the 29th lecture in um, the series that has been the commemoration of Sir Arthur Lewis and um, speaking on his work. Our co celebrations continue tomorrow with the reef laying ceremony. I think we have also the launch of the, sorry, not the launch, but the um, open house at the Derek Walker um, Library, and on Sunday we have our students performing, and that will also be um, broadcast live on NTN. For those of you who are here, we are 
we have some um, takeaway packages for you. So don't neglect to take that before um, curfew is upon us. Thanks again for coming. Good night. <laughs>